Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Rohit Gosain, one of the community medical oncologists, alongside my brother Rahul Gosain, another community medical oncologist, and we are the Oncology Brothers. Today, the topic at hand is early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And what we will be focusing on is CDK46 inhibitors in adjuvant setting. To walk us through all that, we have Dr. Sarah Herowitz from Fred Hutch Cancer Center, Dr. Sherry Shen from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Dr. Eleonora Teplinski from the Valley Health System. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Rohit, when we're talking about adjuvant treatment in these early settings, we have to keep a few things in mind. We're selecting the right patient for chemotherapy, CDK4-6 inhibitors, and even PARP inhibitors with that backbone of endocrine therapy. When we're talking about CDK4-6 inhibitors, today we have two options, abemocyclib based off Monarchy trial and ribocyclib based off Natalie trial. Sarah, starting off with you, can you walk us through the Natalie trial that led to the approval of ribocyclib? Yes, at ESMO, we heard the five-year results from the Natalie clinical trial, and here at SABCS, it was the five-year results based on subgroups. Um, this study um, actually showed not only an improvement in invasive disease-free survival that was um, uh, continuing to endure and improve, um, but also an improvement in distant disease-free survival and distant relapse-free survival, um, around a 30% benefit for each of those. And if you look at the subgroups, there was similar benefits regardless of nodal status, menopausal status, KI-67, um, and endocrine therapy. All right. Well, thanks so much for covering that background, Sarah. Sherry, could you please reiterate where do we stand from the lower dose here, because it's different from what we use in metastatic space, and also how does this broader inclusion criteria differ from what we have for Monarch E for abemocyclin? So in the Natalie study, they used 400 milligrams, which is different from the recommended starting dose that we use in the metastatic setting, which is 600 milligrams. Natalie did include this broader patient population that Sarah already highlighted. It's very different from Monarch E, which essentially selected the highest risk patients. So with Monarch E, patients had to have at least four positive axillary lymph nodes or one to three positive axillary lymph nodes and another high risk feature like grade three disease or tumor greater than five centimeters. Natalie included this broader patient population. So anyone with stage three disease was eligible. Anyone with stage 2B disease was eligible. And then for stage 2A, if they had N1 disease, they were eligible for ribocyclib. If they had T2N0, they had to have grade 3 disease or grade 2 with another high-risk genomic feature. Sometimes I think that's a little bit difficult to conceptualize because you're referring to your, your TNM chart, TNM <laughs> chart, um, to determine the stage. So essentially the way I think about it is anyone with N1 disease or greater is eligible for adjuvant ribocyclin. T4N0, T3N0 patients are eligible, and then that T2N0 criteria I talked about is a little bit more nuanced. So this is definitely a broader patient population that can now have access to CDK4-6 inhibitors. Absolutely. So again, just reiterating the broader inclusion criteria and coming back to that lower dose of 400 milligrams, because that is indeed different than what we've seen in metastatic settings. Eleonora, I know Sarah touched a little on this in terms of that four-year and five-year updates that we've recently seen with invasive disease-free survival. Can you expand a little more on this? What does it really mean for our patients? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I think the important part about that extended uh, long, longer-term outcomes is that we continue to see the benefit in the lymph node negative population as well. And I think that has always been a question of, you know, we had the data for abemocyclib, which is in that higher risk population. So here comes ribocyclib, broader population. And, and people are really asking, I think patients are asking, and then the community is asking too, is does everyone need it, right? Um, because we're adding a lot of to toxicity. We're adding, and it, it's a number of things. We're adding side effects potentially. It is better, I think, with the lower dose, but we're still seeing the side effects. We could talk about that. We're also adding time in the clinic. We're adding labs. We're adding, you know, more visits. So all of these things are adding up. And I think people are really asking is, and patients are saying, I just went through chemo. Now you're putting me on endocrine therapy. I'm on ovarian suppression. And now I need this for three more years. So I think that having that data in the lymph node negative and really showing that significant improvement there is really helpful as we counsel patients and think about how to approach treatment. 
Indeed, it's always a nuanced discussion, but now we have survival data, that conversation becomes a bit easier. And just to clarify on uh, the dosing that was mentioned, so that's 400 milligrams Q daily for three weeks, followed by one week off in adjuvant setting, while in metastatic space at 600 milligrams, again, daily for three weeks on and one week off. Eleonora, now you mentioned a bit about uh, the data and the convincing evidence that we have. How are you deciding now amongst the two options that are available, Abema versus yeah. Ribo? Um, this is a hard discussion. I mean, I think that they are, you know, first you're thinking, okay, Epema is two years, Ribo is three years, right? So for that a year extra medication does make a big difference for some patients. So that's one part of it. I think the side effects, um, you know, are really important. I think now that we have that longer follow-up data for ribocyclib, that's helpful because in the beginning we didn't. And I think we relied on, okay, we have the longer Abema data, let's kind of prioritize that. So now we have this data, you know, with the BEMA, we're seeing more toxicities of gastrointestinal diarrhea, um, and, and that can be really burdensome for many patients. And we, you know, frequently use dose reductions. For ribocyclib, you know, we're a little bit more with the blood count and the myelosuppression. The liver toxicities, although rare, are a concern, and we've all seen, I'm sure, significant liver toxicities from ribocyclib. So I think it's balancing the patient in front of you too and what are their goals, um, what are they able to do, what are their concerns. It's really individualized. I will say I don't have, if patients are eligible for both, I don't have a go-to. It's really individualized.